the technical days. There's days, but you, there's stuff you do on your days off. But when you come here, you come to learn and you work. And you might not be the center of attention. You might you might not be, and it's it's not trying to be the center of attention because you know you just got to grind. And and when you, and I see you grinding and grinding, that's where you're going to get more attention. I kind of give it, I kind of give it that kind of reward. And um, you're not loud. You're not boisterous. You know. And you're a martial artist, and I always keep it down to the, being a martial artist. You know, I've fought in the streets all my life and stuff like that, but I'm still a martial artist, and I, I believe in I believe in the whole philosophy of it, and I think that's what makes somebody a good fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, I've wanted to talk to Lance Gibson Sr. for probably 20 years because he was one of the pioneers of MMA, but there was an amazing fight in the UFC when you fought a really tough guy called Jermaine Andre. And if I recall correctly, you went blind in one eye during the fight and you still yeah, continued yeah. on and you still won the fight. Can you, can you take us through there? Cause I've honestly, I've had this question in my mind. I wanted to hear it from your <laughs> end for two decades now. And now I have the opportunity. Yeah. Well, how it started out was, um, I wasn't training for, um, Jermaine Andre. I was training for Vladimir, Medi Vladimir Medichenko. Okay. And then a week before the fight, a Russian wrestler, and a um, week before the fight, they gave me World Muay Thai champ. I said, oh, okay, we'll take it regardless. I'm going to the UFC. So at the back in the day, it was like I, I fought when, before the time of time limits. So we 30-minute round, so I wasn't really worried. And then um, we got out there, and um, big, strong guy, fast, explosive, but um, had a good game plan to nullify him and – Worked the inside and beat him at his own game. I actually wanted to beat him at Muay Thai and beat him at his own game. And then um, I had a good opportunity when I took him down. I went for the, um, I think it was the rolling arm bar or something. I went flashy and I shouldn't have. Did, I should have went flashy. And then I wasn't. I wasn't mean enough on the arm bar. I should have just broke it and I didn't. I kind of. You see his hand come up and he kind of taps and then he got out and then I said, oh well. When I got then I got back up. He did catch me with the punch and the punch what he caught me with was the the um, stitches on the glove went across my retina and got me down. And thank God it wasn't Yamasaki um, reffing. It was John, big John McCarthy. And he's, he let it go. Cause that changed my career. You know, if they would have stopped it right there, I might not have been Lance Gibson or a bit different, different route, but um, allowed me to work and get through that. And then I remember coming back to the corner and going to Matt Hume, my coach. And I go, Matt, I can't, I, there's three of them. And he goes, hit the guy in the middle. <laughs> so, you know, and I knew my son was at home. I think my son was like three, three years old or so around about then. So I knew he was watching me on, on TV. And I'm like, ain't no way I'm not finishing this guy. I got to go out here and finish this guy. And it was um war of attrition with a great fight. And, and I got the knockout. And, you know, I did, it, at it, that was, point, it was you, just I, a good time. If I recall correctly, you did a lot of clinching and basically pinned him up against the fence for much of the – Next round, and I think you knocked him out with a knee, didn't you? Yeah, I knocked him out with a knee from the tie clinch. Yeah. So I, I guess yeah. by limiting his mobility, it didn't matter. You're in that kind of grappling, feeling where he is with your body, as opposed to seeing where he is with with your eyes phase. Exactly. I figured grab him, nullify him, take his wheels away from him, knee his legs, stomp his feet, work his body, and and, and lay on his arms so you know get some of the explosive explosiveness away from him. And then um, wait for my opportunity, you know, to get it. And it actually came up, and it was fantastic. Yeah, it was great. Right. Were you worried that that uh, the eye damage was permanent, or was that were you not really thinking about that? At well, the time? you know what? I think it was a back in the day. It just had a we. It was a different mentality, a fighter. You know, it was just. Um, I, I, you know, I was young and I was, you know, I, I just think, yeah, I, I was a bit worried, but I was just like, you know what? It's just, you just wanted to fight and I didn't care about the rules. I didn't care about anything. And you know what happened to me? I'll, I, I would just keep going. So it was kind of a, a mentality back then. It was, it came with the, with the, with the package when we fought. Right. Cause you'd fought a bunch in super brawl and then you fought in the UFC yeah. and then you fought in, I think Shudo as well. So those yes, are yes. three very different organizations. This is late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It was. So people talk about the mentality being different then. How how else was the sport different? I mean, people didn't really understand the 
connect. You know, they, they knew jujitsu was important. They knew striking was important. It seemed like people were still figuring out the connections between those two. Yeah. And, um, yeah, cause you'd have a wrestler, then you have a karate guy, then you have a jiu-jitsu guy. I think um, going to Matt Humes actually enabled to put my whole package together. And he was a, lo- a, a step ahead of the game. Like all when I was there, I was already established. And then Josh Barnett was just starting out. Ivan Salaberry, Dennis Holm, and all those guys were in the gym. And so it was like the evolution of MMA was kind of at starting at that time of the gym. At, at that time, it felt like putting it all together. So what did it look like? Were there actually MMA classes or were there, because I remember in that era, you'd go to your boxing or kickboxing class and then you'd go to your jiu-jitsu class and put on your gi. And if you were really progressive, you'd take off your gi top and you'd roll around in your t-shirt, maybe with gloves. Yeah. And that was about as yeah, cutting edge yeah. as it got. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, at match, he was a bit ahead of the game. I remember I was doing Muay Thai with Haru um, Shimanashi. That was Maurice Smith's trainer in the same gym. They were partners. And I had wrestled in high school as well. And I seen the MMA um, classes going on, but I was, I just wanted to, at that time I was just wanting to do Muay Thai. And then Kimo from, um, you don't remember Kimo from the UFC, big guy with the, uh, the cross on his back. He was, he was going to go fight um, Ken Shamrock, I believe. And he was in the gym training. Oh, he was at and Matt there was Humes? an MMA class. Huh? He was at Matt Humes? I didn't know. Oh, oh yeah, okay. yeah. He was in Kirkland, Washington. Matt Humes. Okay. That was a fight when he fought Ken Shamrock. So then they, they had nobody was really crazy enough to spar him, and they asked me to. Um, my coach asked me to spar Kimo. I said, "Cool, I'll spar Kimo." And um, and we had a, probably I think it was eight rounds. We did we did shoot boxing, so that was kickboxing with takedowns. I remember after the first round, he hit me with a jab. And I slipped and went down. He was like, yeah, yeah. And I looked at my coach and he goes, he goes, you know, because I used to mimic t- Mike Tyson back then. So go and do what you got to do. Don't, don't, don't worry about it, what, he, what he's going to do. Don't worry about it. He's going to try to knock your head off. Go and do it. And we went all eight rounds. I ended up taking him down, I think, four times. He took me down five times. And he was a big dude. And um, at the end, I actually um, dislocated my collarbone. At the end, but I didn't even feel it with the adrenaline. When on the next day, I, I went to the chiropractor and I was completely out. But um, then I was like, hey, I think I can make a living doing this. I, you know, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I think I'll do this. So they kept, Matt kept inviting me to the, the MMA class. And I was like, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. And then one day I went in there and I wrestled one of the Lally brothers. And I think I, not Ivan wasn't there yet, but somebody else, not Jeff Munson, somebody else. And, um, I took him down, put him in an arm bar, and they they go, well, how'd you learn that? I said, well, from watching the UFC's Gracie when he used to do it. <laughs> so then, so they go, whoa. Then they told Matt and then everybody else, and they had a world champ, Tobby Ornstein, in there, and I sparred him. I thought he was just some some kid off the street. I didn't know he was already a, a world champ, and then we had a, a war in there, and then my Muay Thai coach goes, do you know who that you just sparred? And I said, no. To- he goes, Tobby Ornstein. I go, oh. I don't know who he is. And he goes, well, he's a, he's a pancreation world champ. And I said, okay, I can make a living at this. And that's when I, I went full bore okay. and um, was training in MMA fully after that. So you, I think you first fought in Super Brawl and I, that was a Hawaiian organization? Yeah, yeah. So you'd fly to Hawaii. That was um, the Bla- Blaisdell Arena. And that's when Vitor Bell, for everybody, was in, it started, kind of started out in that one. Dan Severin, that's how I fought him on my second professional fight. And um, they they had a tournament, so everybody fought, and it was um, there was no rounds, thirty minutes of fight, and they had a tournament to win the the whole title. But they wouldn't. Um, I was a middleweight at the time, and they wanted, but they wouldn't fly me over. They wouldn't pay my ticket. So I said, okay. They go, we have an opening at heavyweight, and I said, okay, I'll just I'll go there when <laughs> heavyweight and fought, <laughs> so I get a free flight over. <laughs> and um, it was it was a good night. It was a good night. Yeah. I mean, at the time, a lot. Dan Severn was probably the most experienced MMA guy around. He was fighting. He was really the first guy to, to fight almost every weekend, or it seemed like every second weekend going yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. He was. Um, he had a lot of fights. He was um, experienced. He was, I think he already had won the UFC title at that point. And they called, I guess they wanted an easy fight for him out in Guam. So I said, um, never been to Guam? Yeah, I'll fight him. I wasn't worried about fighting anybody. I said, I'll fight him for sure, 30 minutes. Just the whole 
idea of it. And when I came out, they said Lance Gibson from Port Moody fighting Dan Severin, and they, they thought I was just going to get killed. I, it's like, I refused to. I refused to. And I, I think that fight gave me um, my name in Japan because I fought such a big guy, and I fought from for 26 minutes, 40 seconds, I believe. And um, that was a, it was just something that I take with me forever. It was, it was, I felt like I was on a different level at that time, uh, spiritually and mentally going into that fight. I had no fear at all. So. So in the terms of how the training for the sport has progressed, I mean, you're, you're teaching, you're coaching people now and your, your kids fighting. And I mean, can you give people an idea of how the training for MMA has changed over the last 20 years? Yeah, it's it's become more of a science, more Olympic kind of based. Um, there's a science behind it. Back then, I was like, oh, 30 minute round. I get on my little MMA gloves and hit the bag for 30 minutes. Then I get on the Stairmaster with a backpack and three medicine balls and, and do that for 30 minutes. And then I go swimming. <laughs> we just did the craziest stuff, you know, and. You know, we just had the dream of this whole thing. We watched the old um, Valley to Doe fights where in BC. We're sitting in a basement watching them on VHS. We're like, yeah, I want to. I wanted to fight Valet Wallet Ismail back in the day out in an outdoor cage in Brazil. I wanted to fight him. <laughs> um, that was I called the um, I don't know was a Frederico Lapenta. He's a some kind of um, promoter down He's a crook or whatever. But I called him up. I said I want to fight Wallet. I want to fight him in front. I'm gonna knock him out. This and that. It was just it was a dream of a kid from Port Moody watching VHS, VHS tapes, you know, we didn't know, really know what to do. Yeah. So was it, let's jump back in time. So you wrestled in high school. Yeah. And then you did, what did you do after that before this, uh, before well, this as MMA? a kid, I, I grew up fighting, hmm. you know, I had to fight. I was only one of the only black kids in the neighborhood. So you know, I had to fight. My dad always taught me. I'm half, I'm half Scottish, half Jamaican. My dad's white, but he's always told me. My dad's my hero, and he's always taught taught me to fight. Don't, um, don't back down, especially if somebody's picking on you because of your color or whatnot. So, and I, it was a wild, wild west back then. You know, when I was growing up, so it was it was an era of, you know, there was racism and stuff like that. And I had great friends and everything, but there was a lot of racism going on, and I never shied from my fight in the drop of a hat so and i was little too so i always fought everybody wanted to fight me and pick on me so when i went to the ice rink or when i went to the swimming pool or i went to the mall i was fighting so i had that in me already and then i went into wrestling and did that and i i loved it and then um went into college i tried to wrestle at douglas college and they just they never seemed to be organized enough so then I remember I was doing movies and stuff like that. And I went down to do a play in Seattle, a conservatory play in theater. And um, that's when I was looking for gyms. Were you a theater and major? No, but I, I did a, I did a conservatory program. Okay. So I did theater down in the States at the Fringe Festival, Seattle Fringe Festival for two years in a row. All right. Yeah. I had no idea. That's yeah, nice. yeah, I used to love doing theater. Yeah. Okay, so sorry. So you were in. You ended up down in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, and then I went to a couple gyms. Never opened. Never organized. And then I was looking for Maury, Maury Smith's gym, and I ended up calling AMC instead. Thank God, because they had such great coaching there. And then I ended up meeting Haru Shimanashi, um, my Muay Thai instructor, and then Matt Hume. And it was just from there it kind of went. I was going back and forth. So I couldn't work in the States, so I was doing plays, taking care of my son, and then going back to Canada, doing some movies, making some money, coming back. And um, that was the program. Well, that's a lot to juggle. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, you see people now, and they, they seem like they can almost be like full-time athletes. And this whole idea of being a full-time fighter and not having another job or being a full-time, even jiu-jitsu guy, you know, like... I'm a blue belt world champion. I should really be a brown belt and I'm training three times a day. And then I'm going for, I don't know, a hyperbaric chamber on Monday, yeah, yeah. Wednesday and Friday and the massage therapy on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And on the weekend, I, I, I don't know, I do something ice baths. This, yeah. this idea of being a professional fighter, uh, was, was pretty rare back then. I don't think there was much of it in, in North America, really. No, not really. And, um, 
it was a time, that's why I say we're built different back then, you know, and it was like, I had to work in the, in the nightclubs, you know, and I had to run my gym and drive down to Seattle and back and forth. And, you know, I had to, oh, and then I finally realized I got to open a gym here because I can't keep going back and forth. I need to train all the time, but I was still working um, the door at, at, um, at, at a nightclub and um, teaching and doing my thing. And it's, I never even thought of having it as a full-time thing. Cause it was just, you never even, you couldn't make the money back then. Or you didn't even, nobody really even had the sponsors to do that kind of thing. So it was like, then I went and started fighting in Japan. I started noticing these guys, don't, the guys I'm fighting aren't working for a living. All they're doing is training full time all the time. You know, the Japanese government either gives them some money or judo does or this and that. So they're actually training all the time and I'm working all day and then going to the nightclub at night and then getting my training and fighting too as well. So it was, there was a transition period near the end of my career that I said, Hey, I can't do all, I can't do both. This is too much. I'm trying to run this gym, work, make money and be at the top level of, of the, of the world. And I achieved it, but it was like, this is getting tough. I can't do both. And I felt like I achieved when I fought for the shooter world title and I beat, um, Suda the first time they didn't make it a title match and I was like oh, okay you guys I, this is for the number one rank I said this is for the title Eric Paulson had retired and um, we were going for the title so they made then that last minute they changed it so then I fought him again and, they, and the funny thing story is what changed my whole perspective about the honor in Japan and the integrity and the martial arts and stuff was they told me, oh, you know, you dirty fighter, don't don't be dirty this time. Be clean. Don't be a dirty fighter. And I'm like, so I, I believed in the the whole tradition of martial arts. And I'm like, well, dirty, the guys, because when he escaped the ropes, I'd punch him through the ropes and stuff like that. So this time when I fought Suda, he must have, but uh, every time I wanted to take him down, he put his butt through the ropes maybe eight times there. And I probably should have just kicked him, kicked him in the head as he was outside the ring or punched him in the head to stop him. But I wanted to be Mr. Honor. And then, um, I still beat him. And then they gave him the, they gave him the, the title. And I was just like, so I got kind of back home. And I said, you know what? I'm making more money doing movies. You know, I'm, I'm pretty content with what I've done. So I, I kind of just, that was my last fight. Yeah. It's like, it's a couple of things there that, that whole honor concept gets invoked pretty quickly by people when it serves them. Right. Like, yeah. This, it's it's dishonorable to train with anyone outside your school, says the instructor. Well, that kind of serves him, doesn't it? Right? Like if if you're yeah. the only, yeah. if he's the only source of your knowledge, then uh, it makes him much more central. It's much much harder to leave him. It's uh, it's not honorable yeah. to fight in this way that makes our champion. It makes it more likely for our Japanese champion to lose against exactly. the black Canadian challenger. <laughs> yeah. Who's already yeah. beat him once? Yeah, it was crazy how they used to fight in the ring in Shudo. And then sometimes they'd put that like mesh, the, like the fishing the bottom, mesh yeah. at the bottom. And it, you know, a significant portion of those matches ended up being about stopping people from falling through the ropes to their doom. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. And with the, when they had the twice a year Valley to those in Shudo, they'd have the mesh in the bottom. And then you could actually kick and stomp the head, do all that kind of stuff as they're trying to escape. So it was like, you know, that back then that was just a dream. I'd love to do, I want to do all of it, you know, but um, in Shudo, I wasn't allowed to do that, but I could still punch him through the kick, the, the, the ropes. And I did the first fight. Mm -hmm. I listened to him on the second. And I shouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I and mean, we've talked about balancing the movie career, the, the teaching, the, the training, the, parenting the working at the club it's even hard when you when you see people who are running clubs and trying to compete at a high level again regardless of whether it's jiu-jitsu or muay thai or mma they're very rarely teaching and competing at the same time right they did maybe their yeah. club but even splitting their attention like okay i got to teach this the five o'clock class to the kids the six o'clock class do a bit of sparring the seven o'clock class do a bit of sparring and then get my own it's just too much of a cognitive load and it's too much of a, of a physiological drain. Oh yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. And it's kind of came full circle now because 
I made my wife, Julia Budd, four-time Bellator champ. And now we're on to the PFL to win this million-dollar tournament. And then I got my son. And I just – the pandemic um, has been interesting in, in the fact that um, it's been real hard on us on the gym, but it's actually been a blessing because I actually have shut my doors now to the general public. And I'm only focusing on my son, my son and my wife and training fighters. And then I'll do, I'll do some private lessons, but we achieved, we achieved four world titles through jewels. And when I was fighting um, high level too, as well, but for, for my wife, four world titles and I'm, I'm teaching five and six year olds that, at three, then going to teen class, dealing with parents angry about something, <laughs> and then I have a health bar in there. And my my worker doesn't show up, and I'm making wraps and salads, <laughs> and then I'm going teaching ladies kickboxing, and then I'm holding for my wife and son. I'm saying I don't. How do we even win these titles? I'm thinking now, since the we, I decided to make the change, it's been full bore me focusing on everything, every angle of their fighting, and it's like I've seen the improvement on them and I'm like and how did we do this guys before? And so, like this is this is amazing. But, and now I can focus 100% on them. So gyms are open now, but you've yeah. you've stayed closed to be more of a training facility for your wife and son. Yeah. Okay, so you took some some something that was imposed on you essentially for a period of time by the by the government and you've turned yeah. it into the optimal training environment for for your loved ones exactly and i you know what it was like i you know I, there i am upset about a few things i was i care about people i got my 81 year old mom here right now she watches Stefan. she knows every fight from back in the day she watches every single fight even some of the ufc's i don't watch she watches she knows everything and, and i take care of her and i and i believe in helping people so I, I followed every rule like i mean my gym is solid to this date like you shoes don't even come inside you have a, a peroxide foot bath outside because we thought this thing was floating around in the air back and when it first bang out so we didn't we thought it was it's like mass on hand sanitizer temperature check bag your shoes at the door six feet apart in boom boom we were doing this this the whole time like i mean and to this day you still have to do that at my gym when you come in, there's a lot of people, I'm not doing that. Well, you're not going to come here. That's the way it is. I'm sorry. This is the way I'm going to handle the situation. And I've kept my wife and son um, healthy and my gym and my members. And, you know, and it was it was great, but it was a lot of work, man. I mean, in, in between every class, I'm freaking mopping and bleaching and, and all that kind of thing. And it was just like exhausting, you know, exhausting. And um, but it came to a point where. I just said, um, my wife and son, they kind of took off to the Sunshine Coast and um, they started um, bees and chickens and on our five acres here. And we started building a gym here on, on the property in the forest. And um, I was coming back and forth, but I was still trying to run the, the whole system. And they had enough. They just said, listen, we can do this a different way. We can do semi-private classes. We can do it a different way. But this is just not worth it. We can't function we're not getting any help they like, we didn't get any help from the government this last shutdown we got zero yeah and then i had to give everybody their money back yeah so it was it was like you know I, I i'm obviously fairly on record for taking COVID seriously and being pro-vaccination but i mean yeah. my my grievances with the british columbia government in the last how they've handled the last six months are are pretty severe like i and i think given that the international audience uh is listening, we probably shouldn't go down that rabbit hole, but you know, like yeah. Mr. You know, I, I even me has got gr gr severe grievances with how our government handled it. Um, yeah. and they were among the more conservative, but you know, uh, it doesn't mean that either you or I are just mindlessly accepting what the government is telling us and you know, taking a look at what the science, uh, you know, and in my case my grievance against them is that they weren't following the science, right? As it, things evolved and it became clear that this thing is airborne, we sh they should yeah. have been saying that. And at one point yeah. they closed the gyms, but not the concerts, not the churches, <laughs> not the uh, movie theaters and not the, uh, the 
uh, what else did they leave open? Sporting events. And that's ridiculous. Yeah. Like if, if there was a reason to close it, okay, that sucks. But let's everybody share yeah. the pain. Let's not just pick on the gyms. So at that point, they totally. lost me. So, um, yeah, that's my the same. I've been following you, and it's the same grievances I have. You know, I was number one down the fighter to help with this whole thing and the and the support and do this, and I did it over and above. And I still held on. My wife still says I'm crazy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they just go. You know, it's like, but it's the fact that you can go get your eyelashes done. And I'm closed next door. And I'm driving by all these schools where these kids are hugging each – these young kids are hugging each other at 50 in the schoolyard, and I'm going down to a closed business. Yeah. You know, and I'm just like, okay, this, this doesn't make sense. If you're going to shut down everybody, take care. If you're going to shut down just just martial art gyms, not even weight gyms, before that weight gyms were open, yeah. then help us. You know, yeah. and they did offer some alone. piddly a- amount yeah. of money. I mean, it was like a thousand oh. bucks at first. Like, come on, that's a rounding I error. In if you've got a couple of employees, but so let's let's you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are people who, there, no matter how bad we have it, there are places that have it way worse. Um, way worse. Yeah. So, what are you building? So, you're on the Sunshine Coast now, which for people who don't know is a I don't know, call it an hour and a half by car and by ferry. From Vancouver, yeah. you're, you're in the hills. What are you? What kind of compound are you building there, Lance? So we got um, my wife's mom and dad got five acres here, and we got we split the the acreage with them. So we have five acres, no neighbors, green belt all around us, and then we got um, my son and my wife put we got bees, we got our own honey, one love honey. We have chickens. We got um, we built another suite with a. I got a beautiful gym, a gym just for training, training them in, you know, so we can come up here. Some of the fighters can stay in the cabins on the property and we're, we're just focused on that's where we, we're training at right now. We just got, she got our new mats from um, Century today, all nice white mats and stuff. And we just put them in today as that as well. And um, we're just kind of building a place where we can live off the land. We got our garden. I fish, we hunt, you know, my son is, he knows everything about every herb, everything like that. We're just trying to be self-sufficient in this area. You know, I deal with the general public for the last 25 years. I kind of just want to be by myself for a bit. You know? <laughs> how, how do you handle the, I mean, I understand how you could do that. Maybe if you were, I don't know, if your wife and your kid were competing in powerlifting or competing in CrossFit, but they're not, they're competing in a combat sport and that requires sparring partners and training partners. And, mm-hmm. Obviously, you can do some of that, but you need more than just one training partner, especially if there's a huge size discrepancy. So how do you handle that aspect yeah. of the training? So that's what was the game plan. When we switched up and said, okay, we're done with the general public, um, I'm keeping only fighters hmm. and my fight team and then people who want to be sparring partners. The guys who have been with me 20 years that are, could kill it in the UFC, but they work nine to five but behind a computer. You know, and they've been with me for 20, 25 years. So I kept that crew and I got, and it's like, now that we want to keep the doors shut, it's like, now people want to even come more. And I'm just like, well, no, we can't, you know. And I actually, funny thing is I've, since COVID start, my front, both my doors, my business are locked and I have the gates across and nobody, people knocking the door. I don't answer the phone. I don't do anything anymore. So it's like, we don't have customers like that anymore so people always kind of come in and we're just we're, we're closed and we're done but we have fighters and i keep my fighters going so then my wife and we split the week so we're, we're in town like tuesday night to saturday and then we're on the coast half the other half of the week and um so we have specific fight times where i train my fighters and my wife and son so i'm pushing them in in town and then i've, I've had students over here on the coast for the last 20 years as well that that travel from here to come to um, Port Moody. So now that I have it up here, I have a, I have a good handful of tough guys that can spar my wife and my son up here too as well. So it's kind of, it, I'm going to build it a little bit more. So I, I, both places I have an equal number and just keep building people. So we have bodies and, and keep going. Mm-hmm. What's the uh, one big evolution in, in MMA and to some extent uh, even boxing has been the awareness of head trauma in the last 20 years and gradually becoming aware that, you know, like getting your bell rung isn't just getting your bell rung now. It's putting you a little bit closer towards 
you know, long-term brain damage. Yeah. Back in the day, you'd kind of get in there, stand and bang and prove your manhood and make it a good way to make yourself tougher, quicker. But I, uh, I'm kind of leery of how many brain cells I lost during that process. Yeah. How are you handling that now? Are you, are you well, I think that, yeah. Um, I think that my style has always been a style that I don't, like I can sit there and brawl with you, but I don't need to. I'm gonna I'm gonna take you into a different realm. If you whatever you're gonna do, I'm gonna do the opposite. And then when I want to brawl with you and cut angles and do all those things and keep yourself safe. And then all with my wife, I love her to death. So I'm like, well, GSP. That's what we're doing. That's what I catered her whole style over was GSP. And it was like, you know, just he didn't take that much damage. Right. And he, you know, look at him now. He's still he's a beast still. And I, I've always made – catered her profile after that. And then my son, he grew up in the gym since he was a baby. So he kind of followed both – he can do both. And he wrestled um, in the States at a high level. It was an, all, an All-American. And then he wrestled a little bit at Arizona State. And then I said, come back and do MMA. And he, he did. And it, it's just having that style instead of you – know, you know, you can know you can be sit there and brawl with somebody. And it's, that's good to know you can have that, but don't do it. You know, and that's how I feel that maybe that's why my wife's had such a long career. Just the style we've kind of catered towards her not taking enough that, that much punishment. She hasn't really. You have people with very different opinions about headgear uh, and cages to protect the head. And some people say that it increases the amount of head trauma that you take because you're a larger surface area. It's harder to slip. And in some cases, you're creating a longer lever arm. If somebody hooks you, it twists your head harder. And some people say it pads your head. Where do you fall on the, the head? Or is headgear for you mostly a thing for stopping cuts? Or Yeah, I honestly, um, I think it helps with both. I know, I know some people that don't believe in it. And those guys aren't true stand-up fighters. So I know, and I'm not the ones, the ones that I know, not everybody, but I remember I learned my lesson. I never wore it back in the day. And then I was invited down to um, Big Bear to stay with, um, I was training, I was coaching Dennis Hallman to fight Jens Balver. And we were down there with me, T we're in the same house as Tito, um, Dewey Cooper, Randy Couture, everybody was in, the, and Rico Rodriguez, we were all in the same training camp. And I, I was the only guy that showed up with no headgear. And I was like, and we're in a we're in the Big Bear camp where all the boxers, everybody, everybody else had headgear. I remember Tito saying, "You don't wear headgear, Lance." I go, "No, nah, not even. You're crazy, man." I'm like, "Maybe I am crazy." That's after that, I started wearing headgear, hmm. and I and I've wore it since, and it does protect from cuts a lot, most mostly. And I feel that um, even my son, I even got the the winning bar across, you know. My wife hasn't doesn't she, doesn't she doesn't wear the bar across, but my son does. It's you know he's in with big dudes. You know I got big guys in my gym, and we can't always have smaller guys for him. So I just feel it does give him a little um, protection. All right. Tell me about the Big Bear. Used to be the mecca of training camps where you'd go to prepare for your UFC fight. I don't know if it's still the same way, but describe to me what uh, you know the, a Big Bear training camp looked like. You you oh, man, you went there awesome. just as a coach, or did you ever go there as an athlete? I was I was still a fighter, but so I was I was training too as well. But I was coaching Dennis Hallman, but I was I think I was still fighting in Shudo at the time. Yeah, I was near the end of my career because that's when uh, nine eleven happened. So it was kind of like we were we got we rented a house. It was Tito, me, Rico, Rampage when he was just first starting out. Everybody, Jason Miller, everybody. It was a it was a killer camp. And I remember getting there and um, feeling the, the the elevation. And we're doing the armbar drill, you know, how you just warm up and do the armbar drill. And it was like Holman couldn't last more than 20 seconds. And I'm like, get out of here. Get out. <laughs> then I got on there and I was like, holy crap, I'm I'm exhausted after a minute. I'm like this. So I went down to the local store, grabbed the BMX bike for me and Holman. And, we, and that's what we made, we made sure we rode through town on BMXs all day just to get our cardio up and get acclimated. And then – because it's high It'd elevation. Be up in the morning. Yeah, the elevation is real, totally. So one thing I learned from Tito was um, probably one of the only things I could learn from him back <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> this guy lost his mind. Local but, governance. Uh, you could you could get a you could get a lesson in how to uh, how to run a city council. 
Yeah, that guy, man. Oh, my God. But uh, he just said, you know, the 6 a.m., getting up at 6 a.m., he goes, we don't fight at 6 a.m. So I, I don't believe you have to get up at 6 a.m. You know, you enjoy your night. You stay up late, watch movies, whatever. Get your rest. And then, we, you know, our first training session was 11. And I've kind of put that my whole career. You're going to get up and make yourself extra tired mm -hmm. at 6 a.m. And then you're going to have another training session midday, maybe technical. And then you have another training session at late at night. Like at fight time, when you're the main event, you're fighting near 10 o'clock, 11 or whatever. So I kind of catered that off that. We did that for a long time. and But in Big Bear, we had everybody. So we had two houses and we were training. And um, then we could get a phone call. I don't even I don't know if we even had cell phones back then. I can't remember, but I remember we get <laughs> got a phone call on the hard on the, on the on the home line at the house, and my mom was wanted to talk to me, and she goes, "You guys okay?" I go, "What?" And then we still looked at the news, and we saw the explosions, and it was almost felt like the movie Red Dawn because we're up in the hills, and we thought people were coming. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what was going on, but I, that was our my a good that was a memory from back then. And we all had fights, and that's kind of it was it was it was great. It was a good camp really good camp so if i was a fighter back in the day and i'm setting up my i'm gonna have a training camp at big bear i would pay for the house yeah would i pay to bring all the uh the other people in or would they come just to get additional training um you know i think tito brought some people in he paid them but i know dewey cooper came in for sparring and i'm still training with dewey and he trains my wife and son too as well and i um Holman, I think he paid my trip as well to come down there. So, you know, some people just, some people paid their own. Some people just came from California. So they, they didn't have, they just stayed in the house and um, you kind of shared your groceries and we all cooked it together at the same time kind of thing. And it was, um, we, uh, we rented the gym. I think Tito rented the gym out. So it was, uh, and the gym was um, like a, just a boxing gym. And then we had to drive an hour if we wanted to wrestle. That was a weird thing. So we had to drive an hour somewhere in the hill to a, a high school so we could wrestle. It made no sense. But then as time got on in the years, people realized, hey, you know what, I'm going to put mats in the house and all that stuff. But back then, we, we, it was split. It, was, it, was, it wasn't really organized at that point. Yeah. So how long a training camp, fast forwarding to today, how long a training camp do you think is ideal for a fighter? I think sometimes fighters, they almost wear themselves out more. I mean, I, I, that the, by the time they've, they come to fight, They've, they've been training so yeah. hard for so long that they're not as sharp as they would be if they'd had a shorter camp. Yeah, you know, I, I like I like 68 weeks. Okay. I do. Um, I know how to bring it up, bring it down, bring it up, bring it down, and then peak. I feel that – but that's when I'm dealing with somebody who's like my wife and son who are elite athletes, healthy, take care of their bodies and train. Now, when I train Rampage – I came in 13 weeks ahead of time because he was 80 pounds overweight. Oh my God. So, oh yeah. And then I come into California and I have to get him in shape. And then I, I had uh, the stories I could tell you about what I did in England with them. With How did Wolf you get him in shape? Stuff. Oh my, huh? Part of me. How did you get him in shape? How do you, I would, I would, I would start off sparring with him. I'd take him on light runs. I'd just get him lifting weights and get him moving his body and get him out of the nightclubs and all that kind of thing. And it's kind of detoxify him first. Hmm. And get his body movement. The guy, like, for what he has achieved being that heavy, and, and then he get, he'd actually get in shape for the fight. But it was like every time it got harder. Every time I went back for the next fight, it get harder and harder and harder. And I just and there's in that time there's just so many managers and money and gangsters and the stories I could tell you, man. You could write a book on it. And um, I just finally said for the John Jones fight, I had to just say, listen, man. Unless you get rid of some of these people, I can't coach you anymore, man. I just can't do it. And then fast forward to now, he, he talks to my wife and goes, I should have listened to the coach. People took him for a lot of money. And, you know, it was a, it was a, he goes, coach told me, but I, I, I couldn't listen at the time. So, you know, but he, the guy, he'd somehow get in shape. He just cut his food and have him work and he'd get in shape. But that thing is he would get in shape, but you're not getting better because you're just fighting training camp to get in shape and a lot of fighters still do that they're not getting better in the gym they're just getting in shape for the fight and they haven't improved their skills you know and and i've that's what i've noticed so that's why 
we've changed up a lot of things and we have over the years anyways, but that's what I like to focus constantly getting better. And then when it's time to push ourselves, we're not out of shape. We're, we're actually in good shape. And then then we push ourselves to the next level. But you don't think that you could stay at that level of conditioning the whole time? No, no, you can't. It's too much. It's, um, you can't be at that, you'll burn right out. And there's guys like that, like Bisbing. I remember him in the gym in, in England. You can't st- you can't have him stop training. Yeah. But he, you know, he would just keep going. Like you do a two hour practice and then you want to do more. And it's like, it was too, that's too much, you know? And you can't stay at that level all the whole time. You're going to burn yourself right out. You're absolutely right. Okay. How much sort of auxiliary training does a fighter need? Like how much? You know, in, in addition to the sparring, you know, the clinch sparring, the wrestling sparring, the kickboxing sparring, the MMA sparring, the sparring on the ground, how do they include or should they include weight training and uh, cardio training? Yeah, I think that you can make your cardio work on the mats, but I still think that it's a little bit of a – it keeps it help keeps the weight off going for your runs or doing your swims helps you with your cardio really well because you got to breathe and – control your breathing for certain people. I still think the weights are good. Even if it's, even if it's only cosmetic, because with rampage, once I get him that vein to pop out of his bicep, he thinks he's a killer. You know, <laughs> He's not any stronger. He's not, in any shape. but when he starts losing the weight and feeling his, his, his body come back, that gave, that gave him so much confidence. So different fighters are different. I know my wife and son, they do their ways to do their strength and conditioning and they're on it. They're on it and they're, they're good. But I still, I'm worried about the heavy deadlifts and stuff like that, you know, because it does affect you when you're wrestling the next day and going in for shots and your back's killing you. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of monitor it a little bit. I think it's, I think it is good. Just not too crazy if you're training that hard in, the, in, in martial arts. Yeah. Well, since we're on the topic of strength and you just mentioned uh, Rampage, where did that insane spinal erector strength come from? Like his ability to pick, I mean, I, I remember talking to Chris Brennan and Chris Brennan was doing jiu-jitsu with uh, Rampage, got him in an arm bar and Rampage stood up with one arm and held him above his head yeah. and basically like, do you want me to slam you? And he's like, no, <laughs> like go to the arm bar. And that... That's just a level of strength that's hard to achieve with. It's um, that's, I mean, I could weight train two times a day, go on all the yeah. steroids I wanted. I would never come anywhere near close yeah. to that level of insane core strength. I think it's probably genetics. And I think being a country boy down south, and re- he wrestled back then, and he had that same pile driver strength back when he was a kid. I think he's just kind of blessed with it, mm-hmm. you know, because he's not the hardest worker at all so it's like this guy has natural ability and natural strength that i haven't seen in many people yeah. well it's amazing when you have that natural ability combined with an amazing work ethic i mean that's when you get the yeah uh, I, I would argue that george st pierre is maybe one of the better examples of that again i mean had a yeah. god-given talent but also an incredible work ethic I think he's fantastic. I think he's one of the greatest. Yeah. So where do you see uh, MMA going in the next few years? Like, wh- what do you developments do you see coming? And if you want to go in crazy and make some predictions as to, you know, <laughs> running cage kicks, is that going to take over the sport? <laughs> uh, what's the next big thing? I think, um, I think it's just constantly evolving. You got these young, this second generation of, of, kids that were fathers were pioneers and and the the things they're doing now like uh, i'm watching charles Oliveira fight and he's the kid he's i mean he's not a kid he's fantastic he's been around for so long but it's just the things he's doing and the different um things that these these younger generation are doing it's just it's just evolving it's i think it's just gonna get better and better it's just we need a union. We need something where people begin to get paid correctly, you know, and have benefits and all that stuff. You know, I think that's where we need to see it going. But I think all these new organizations coming out, I think the PFL has a really good idea, uh, like a 
a business model, you know, and, and you have ability to make some money. And that's why I brought my wife over there. How is it different from you the know? UFC business model? Well, because you could, you got a season now. Now you're training for a season like the NFL. So now I know I'm guaranteed five fights this year, every eight weeks, six to eight weeks. I have the ability to make this much money, this much money, this much money. And when I win the final, I make the million. So her whole career, we've been fighting all the time. We were the four-time Bellator champ. We don't know. We didn't know when next. They put your, they, you know, they put her on the shelf for a year. Oh, you got nobody to fight you. Well, I'm not making money. You know what I'm saying? Well, I got a five-fight deal, but I only got two fights on the deal before the end of it. You know, having a schedule is very important. You know, not to say my son's in Bellator, and I, I love Bellator. It's my home. But the business model of having a season that you can train for and know you're guaranteed, well, this is what I'm going to make next year. You know, instead of going out there and going, am I going to fight or I'm not going to fight? Right. You know? You know, it's the same, you know, the UFC seems to be fighting some of these younger up-and-comer guys more, but you still don't have a guaranteed schedule. And I think the guaranteed schedule gives you, like, something solid, a foundation for, okay, now this is my career, this is my season, I'm training for it, and we're going, you know. And I think for, as a fighter, even, and, you know, as a fighter, it's a, it's a good opportunity. There does seem to be a reasonably big movement towards trying to get some kind of unionization going within the UFC. Uh, obviously, mostly from people who are no longer in the UFC. <laughs> yeah. Because if you were in the UFC and you tried oh, to get yeah. that going, you'd be blackballed in a, in a heartbeat. Absolutely. But do you think, what what's required? Like, is, is this part of the Alley Expansion Act? I mean, that's not yeah. unionization per se. That's just more fair, um, more fair treatment of fighters. Yeah, I think it's the, the treatment of fighters, um, benefits. Um, also, you know, knowing the promote. I, I believe I'm not fully up on it, but I, I see. I follow up what Nate Quarry has been doing and talking about. And it's about the promoter makes this much. Well, the, this much percentage goes to the fighters, so they're guaranteed to get paid properly. You know, and I think that's that's really important because you got guys still fighting for what I fought for back in the day. I think less. And it's like um, you fight. You got some of these guys fighting for f two and two or five and five. You know that is that's not even our grocery bill. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So it's like there's got to be something here. You know, it's, there's got to be something here to make sure that everybody's getting taken care of. Share the wealth, right? Yeah. Boy, so you love communism, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably a fascist yeah. and a communist at the same time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah that's what we i guess what i am huh that's what the, the new thing is they, they are talking about yeah. it boggles my mind man yeah. accusing yeah. anyone you don't like of being a communist and a socialist communist. and a fascist yeah pedophile satan satan worshiper it's just yeah yeah um one of the most exciting i mean i don't follow muay thai as much as i would like but uh, I got to admit, I'm addicted to clips of uh, Sanchai fighting. Oh, yeah. He's the guy who invented, or not invented, but basically incorporated like the one arm cartwheel kick. And just to yeah. watch him fight is kind of like watching, you know, you know a glitch in the Matrix. And it's, yeah. it's imagine yeah. if, like, I don't know, Lomachenko and his footwork uh, was applied in Muay Thai with the, oh, with the yeah, crazy right? kicks. With and kicks this... deadly, you know. I know Sancho is fluid, smooth. He's he's fantastic. And Lomachenko, I tell I tell always tell my son my, when he's sparring Lomachenko, Lomachenko, because just that footwork has as he's turning the corner, they're turning the face, and you're hitting them. It's just it's if you can put that all together with MMA and Muay Thai with elbows and knees. Fantastic. So how do those guys train that? Is it? It's got to be. I'm obviously they're gifts. But there's got there've got to be systems for doing that kind of crazy footwork and that kind of high level strategic thinking within a match. And how do you how do they train it and how do you teach it? Because I mean, if we're just standing there slugging at each other, we're gonna get tougher. Yeah. Maybe we'll learn to figure out to move a little bit or you know, hey, I'll move my head out of the way. But to get to that next level getting behind the guy kind of yeah of, that's 
well, that is next level. I think it was it goes all the way back to Roy Jones and um, Sweet Pea Pernell Whitaker, the boxers back in the day. Pernell used to take people's backs all the time, and Roy Jones took James Tony's back. I think I think three times during the fight, and when he turned around, he hooked, triple hooked him. So I've always been a fan of the of the the when I did Muay Thai, I was always a fan of the Western style of Roy Jones uh, um, boxing. So I always incorporated that incorporated that into my into my Muay Thai. I always thought traditional Muay Thai was more bravado and you're sitting there clashing shins. I didn't really want to do that. So incorporated the slick footwork of Roy Jones into Muay Thai and that's kind of how our style of Muay Thai is and it's just cutting those corners and making the person turn and face and hitting them. The one thing I haven't been the greatest to try to slip the punches. My son's a lot better than that. but That's a, t- that's a tougher one to teach but Cutting the angles is just all footwork and, you know, and if you can cut the angles and shoot too as well, it's, it's, you're not there for, you know, they're not, you're not there for them when they turn, you're underneath them. And we kind of just, not everybody gets it, but you know, you can teach it. You just got to keep teaching the cutting that angle, cutting that angle and knowing your distance, I think is very important as well. Oh yeah. So say you had a, an up and coming, I don't know, 18 year old that you wanted to teach that idea of cutting the angle. We'll just make this super granular. We'll just take one concept, cutting the angle, and we'll take a reasonably skilled but reasonably untutored individual. How would you go about training them to become better at that? Like solo footwork drills it's, or pulling yeah. you know, pad drills or or how? It it's um it would start with um footwork drills and and being on the outside of the foot and making that person and then knowing your distance is the main thing. It's like I, I'm working with my wife right now. It's just knowing when the person can touch you and knowing when the person can throw and you can just slip a little bit and then over top. So it's about knowing the distance and cutting the angle where it's hard for them to hit. And I kind of always taught that. So even to the beginners, I'm saying you stand in front and you're going to you're, – you're straight on. You're square. You got – you can get taken down. You're, you know, you got to cut that angle and be here and make them reach and make them constantly move and cut that angle where you're not not going to get hit as much. And even in Evander Holyfield back in the day, people used to think he got hit, but you, if you watch the way he rolls with the punch and he cuts the angles, he's actually not taking full power. It's a, some of the I think I got a lot of it from the old school boxers. Yeah. Yeah, it, it looks like they're getting hit, but they're either shoulder rolling it or they're yeah. – and there's a big difference between moving forward and getting hit in the face and moving backwards and getting <laughs> hit in the face. I don't, yeah. I don't know what the difference in speed is, but – it's probably a difference in 20, 20 miles an hour. Uh, you know, For you sure. Move your head forward at 10 miles an hour, move it back at 10 miles an hour. So, yeah. Um, yeah. What did, so let's just finish up with what advice would you give to up and coming fighters about getting more technical, about preserving their longevity in their career and about getting tougher? Like what, what, what are the things that you find yourself saying most often to your fighters? My fighters, um, I'm old school, so it goes right back to being humble, um, coming in with an empty cup. Every, all my fighters clean the toilet. They clean the mats. They clean the bags. Don't care who you are. If you're a four-time world champion, that's what you do. If you don't want it, a lot of people don't come to my gym because of that. But that takes away the whole ego part of it, of the situation. Then I got a, somebody comes in there with a an empty cup and – Come here, work, 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 mat time, work. Be a good person, be healthy. You know, the technical days, there's days, but there's stuff you do on your days off. But when you come here, you come to learn and you work and you might not be the center of attention. You might, you might not be. And it's it's not trying to be the center of attention because, you know, you just got to grind. And and when, and I see you grinding and grinding, that's where you're going to get more attention. I kind of give it, I kind of give it that kind of reward and um, you're not loud, you're not boisterous, you know, and you're a martial artist. And I always keep it down to the, being a martial artist, you know. I fought in the streets all my life and stuff like that, but I'm still a martial artist. And I, I, believe in, I believe in the whole philosophy of it. And I think that's what makes somebody a good fighter and a good yeah. person. Yeah. Well, those are two different things, aren't they? Yeah. It, uh, yeah. And I, I suppose ultimately – by having rules like that, you know, the everyone cleans the toilet rule, you're, yeah. you know, you may not be cherry picking for the very best people in the sport, but you are certainly ensuring that the people you work with are people that you want to work with. 
Exactly. And I could have one fighter as long as I don't care about having 20 fighters. I've had the 20 fighters. I've had all – I've most of the guys in BC that have gyms I've were on my fight team. And there's a lot of them I don't claim. There's a lot of them I do, I do claim, you know. But it's how you end that story off. And a lot of them grew, have grown up and came back to me 20 years later and go, Coach, you – you know, you – I was an idiot back then. You showed me how to be a man and this and that, and, you know, you know, but I think that, yeah, I won't get all the top, top line, top of my people. But even when Rampage came in, he was cleaning the gym. You know, it doesn't, it just doesn't matter to me. Um, I'd rather have one good person than 10 bad, you know, and I don't care if you're a world champion. I don't care what you are. It doesn't, I'm, I'm in this to make good people and be around good people and enjoy it, you know, and if you become a champion, that's great. Yeah. Well, I mean, how many people, e- even if your only goal was financial, which it's not, but it, even if it was, if you get one amazing fighter who's a complete egomaniac and he beats the snot out of 10 of your students, and they say, screw this. I hate kickboxing. And they never come back. Great. Yeah. You've got the one world champion, but you've just lost 10 students. Call that, I don't know, 150 bucks a month, 150 bucks a month profit each. He's just costing yeah. you 15 grand a year for the exactly. privilege of having this big name guy at the school. The, the, the ego tied up in with coaches has so much ego tied up in having a great fighter that they're totally willing to overlook that the damage that one guy does to mm-hmm. everybody else who's training with them. And I, it's, it's terrible. I'm not saying that all great fighters like are terrible that. people, but there are, there are well, great fighters who are terrible people. Yeah, lots. And um, there's a lot of schools that run their schools like that because they, they're so desperate to have a good fighter. And I, I before – now I'm training fighters. Before you asked me a few years ago, I when I – well, 15 years ago when I had one of the best fight teams in North America from out of BC, it was babysitting. I didn't – it was like, you guys didn't make me any money. You're not making me money. You're actually costing me money when I leave town to, to corner you guys. I got to, you know, run my school here. So it was actually – I was kind of – had a different mentality. I didn't really want it anymore. And now it kind of grew out of my wife and son and a couple good students that have been with me for 15, 20 years that became champions that I was like, oh, you know, I'm only going to focus on the on the good people. From that martial arts school I have, the stories, stuff that I could tell you, would be the most insane movie you've ever heard of. Ever. <laughs> ever heard of. And, and this is just being a martial art business owner. Without mentioning <laughs> names, what's the craziest one? As long as this doesn't oh, result in fuck. somebody going to jail. Pretty close. Almost me. Um, I had um, a party for um, all my students and good clients. And I, and back then, you know, there's certain types that want to be around fighters, right? And they're gangsters or bikers or whatnot. Who knows? And I trained a few. And I actually, the weirdest thing is, this guy with a white supremacist came to me. He had, <laughs> he had <laughs> Nazi signals. He had stuff all over his forehead, this and that. And I asked Matt Hume, I go, what do I do? Because I, I had a history of beating them up in the street. <laughs> so I'm just like, Matt, what do I do? And he goes, well, you know, usually they're not that bright. So their followers, let them follow you. So I, um, so I, I, I took them on. I said, take those tattoos off. He, he got them all erased. Like he got them all put over. He was about six, six, close to 300 pounds, tough, tough enforcer or whatnot. Then I had a whole crew of other guys from the same kind of area. And, um, I trained these guys. I made a lot of money, privates, this and that. It was like, I had this whole crew of guys with me and, henchmen and this and that but it's just it's just like a pit bull once he gets the taste of blood they um turn on you so they turned on me so some of the crew um i'm brought to the top of the canada tko and he um lost his fight and then turned on me but not to my face so at this party I have, I've always had cameras in my gym, so I have it on camera too, which saved my, my, saved me. But, um, wasn't up, it was kind of a mutiny on the bounty. And I had this beautiful I, tables and wine and a roast pig and all this stuff. And, um, everybody's drinking and having a good time. And I had front the bill for all my good clients. And, um, 
Well, I, I watched the tape later, but I'm sitting up over by our health bar and um, I'm talking to somebody's wife. And that guy that I turned his life around got up from his chair. He spoke with the little crew, got up from his chair and beelined it for me and cold cocked me in the side of my temple. And the martial art Lance wasn't there. The street Lance came back out and I, I put him, I put him in a coma and the party was over. And I had, I was left by myself to clean this up and everybody left and kind of from that crew and kind of started their own gym. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, I won't mention any names. And um, it's interesting how karma works and um, things happen. Well, this guy was in a coma for a few days for about three or four days. And I, I, I thought I was going going to jail for murder, man. I was just like, but I was like, I got on tape. He attacked me. He's already a criminal from jail. Talked to a couple of my cop friends. They go, you'll be okay. Just get a good lawyer. <laughs> this and that. <laughs> but I had, it was a lot, it was a stressful time. No and shit. I remember that. And I remember all the people that left me and all the people, and it felt like it was the end of the world, end of the world at the time. But I'm standing up. I'm standing up for myself regardless. And that, um, that story turned out where he came out of it and then, this whole gym started and this and that. And I kind of just stayed focused on my, my path. And I, I ran into them, but it almost like the universe took care of these people. And one by one they dropped or I don't know. They, the universe took care of them. And magically it was just, it was just interesting. But I got a phone call from that, that guy maybe eight years after. And I guess, I don't know if he was an AA or what it was, but he did a, a like a 20 minute confession of what happened that night, who set me up and I changed his life and he's sorry for being a, um, what he did and this and that. That's just one, one of many stories that a martial arts instructor wouldn't, you wouldn't think had to go through. I'm, I'm dealing with these people, man. I'm just like, I'm just trying to run a business. He was at the making <laughs> amends step, whatever step that is, the 12 step program. Yeah, I think go, so. Go I and think find so. the people that you've wronged and then apologize it, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad uh, he's not dead, and I'm glad you're not dead, and uh, I'm glad yeah. that you know you can laugh about it now. I'm sure you weren't laughing about it then when you thought you were going to the can for uh, yeah. For no, no, I didn't. I didn't. I was pretty worried at the time, but then I said, you know, uh, if I, if it is, it is. Yeah. And then like Rampage's camp, that that whole story is is one that you could it's you couldn't even understand dealing with them when I was in Liverpool. Uh, and coaching them, it was just your my life was on the line dealing with some of the people in that in that camp. Well, it, it's it's true that sort of the Hell's Angel biker drug dealer scene that there's a certain amount of if you're a, an HA and you want credibility, you open an MMA gym, and probably yeah. if you want to launder money, you open, I'll, I'll say it out loud. Uh, oh, absolutely! A cash business is pretty good. So you know, either a laundromat or an MMA gym. And no, I just happen to have, you know, uh, fifty people paying me a thousand bucks a month in you know, <laughs> in twenties, <20s. laughs> yeah. and that's why I'm making this deposit. It you you do have to be careful. I think it's a little bit better now, but there was certainly a time yeah. when every second MMA gym had some really seedy connections and just about every MMA gym had some really questionable people training there. And it was usually, there'd be a bunch of cops and firefighters and there'd be a bunch of health angels on the same yeah, map yeah. <laughs> and they'd kind of yeah. stay separate. It, um, but yeah, there, there's, there's a long history there. I mean, just look at, uh, how pride got annihilated in Japan, right? I mean, it, the connections to the Yakuza yeah. were, were, if I recall correctly, the television station said, no, we're not. It'd be like um, the pay-per-view network saying, no, we're not going to air the UFC because they've got all these ties to the mafia. I I'm not saying the UFC has ties to the mafia, yeah, despite yeah. it being in Vegas. I'm sure it's 100% <laughs> clean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was a pretty big thing, and it brought down the biggest fighting organization in the world. So there is this, you know, there is this, Hell's attraction angels. to it yeah and so be yeah, careful it's, it's of real you... for sure yeah so do your yeah. do your research google is your friend and uh before you send your kids to yeah. a gym try and you know whether it's jujitsu or anything google the instructor's name and things like assault charge oh uh, yeah yeah i know i i funny cause like i always drive to drive around and i go and i i've been in the business and you've been in the business long enough and i'm like Laundromat, 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 laundromat. Up to each gym. I'm just like, 
they'll be in, they'll be open for this many, this many months. This one's, oh, he's still going. He's got nobody in there. It's guaranteed. It's like, I know, I know what it takes. You know what it takes to, to pay the bills at a gym, you know, and have a facility that big and stuff like, or, or whatnot. It's, it doesn't come just with signed up students all the time. Yeah. So I know you're pretty active on Twitter. Uh, how do people find you there? I, I'm not going to tell them how to find your uh, your compound. Uh, oh but, yeah, <laughs> but um, I'm a Lance Lance Gibson SR right on um, Twitter. I'm a different personality on Twitter than I am on like Facebook or anything else. That's kind of my Twitter's my um, safe place. Of a, well, yeah, political side too. Kind of, I think I'm I'm kind of a little bit more outspoken about things and on on Twitter, and uh, you know I kind. I'd like to thank you and for that because so many of the MMA fighters, I mean, my audience by this point knows I'm going to say something like this. Uh, so many <laughs> MMA fighters have gone full conspiracy and full uh, hard, hard right. And that know, it's, it's, it's refreshing to see somebody in who's been in the game for a long time who's, uh, in my mind, a little bit more sane. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, no, I, I see it too, and it's 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 embar it's a bit embarrassing for mm. for what I'm concerned. You know, I find it embarrassing, which is, makes sport. it important for people, you know, for people to be. I mean, for people to, like you and I to be outspoken and you know try and show that not everybody in the community believes in I don't know giant tunnels under the earth that are being used to yeah. house bioweapon. <laughs> Uh, facilities in Ukraine and also child trafficking yeah. and also and that Putin is a white hat light worker like uh, give me a <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah it's 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 insanity okay so people they can find you on Facebook they can Lance Gibson Senior they can find you on Twitter anywhere else that you want to send them yeah um, Instagram Lance Gibson Senior same thing just um, just we kind of just have um, on those ones, like Instagram, you follow me, and it's, it just shows us our life and what we do. We're we're hunting, we're fishing, we're fighting, we're living off the land, you know, and just trying to be, you know, trying to be good people. And, and we love our fam I love my family. So it's kind of, that's what we're, what we're up to, you know. Okay. So you can always check it on there for sure. Well, next time I'm out on the Sunshine Coast, I'd love to uh, to see your, uh, see your brand new white mats. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care, man. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.